turn out the lights and we'll get started. Again, um, today will be a relatively short day um, for two reasons. One is that not everyone has access to the software. <coughs> and um, two, again, it's just meant to be an overview and make sure that everybody gets a pretty good idea of what this class is about. And um, as you can tell, after taking roll, there was only one no, no show on Monday, but we have one, two, three, four, five people who aren't here. Uh, so I must have scared some people away on Monday. Okay, so to open Lightwave, double click on the hard drive if it's not in applications. Okay, and then inside applications here. Scroll down to where it says Lightwave 8. And then within the Lightwave 8 folder, select programs. And then within this folder, there are two applications that you need to open. <coughs> um, the first is down here, it's called Modeler. So just double click on that. As it launches, you will notice that there is a second application that opens and it's, you'll see it in the dock down below. It's called the hub. And I will explain that in just one minute. Then the other application that you'll want to open is, should be just plain old Lightwave. Where is it here? Uh, I don't want register Lightwave. I don't want here. Lightwave, right here, where it says just Lightwave. Not Lightwave command line, not um, register Lightwave, not any of those, just plain old Lightwave. And double click on that. And then you'll have all three applications launched. <coughs> okay, everybody with me? It's Modeler. That's really where, where we will spend most of our time this semester, but not all of our time. When you're, for those of you who have taken the animation class, you'll spend, mo you spend most of your time in Lightwave. A little bit of time in Modeler, but for the most part, since you're not required to build any models in, in the animation class, um, you open pre-packaged or pre-made ones and you work in, in Lightwave itself and that's where the timeline is and that's where um, you're able to actually do some animation. Um, if this is working properly and you have opened both of these and you'll see at the bottom you have Lightwave, Modeler, Hub. What the Hub does, it, it is a separate application but it's one that you don't want to actually see or use. It should be open, but the fact what it does is it allows integration between those two applications. And you'll know that it's working when you can do the following. You'll see in the upper right-hand corner where I have Lightwave 3D 8.2 here. If I click on Modeler, it should toggle over so that I see the Modeler, and you should be able to go back and forth. Okay, and if I come up here to the modeler window and I click on this, it'll say switch to layout and you'll notice that I'm back over to layout. Now I can toggle back and forth between both, a both applications. It's really critical that the hub works, otherwise it will be a nightmare. It doesn't have to be functioning, but it will make your life much more difficult. Question? I, you got to speak up. Where's the other one? You mean up here? I, I'm sorry, I don't know where you're talking. Uh, oh, Command P? Apple and F12. Yeah, that will work too. So if you want the key commands, that will work as well. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you're saying. Yeah. 
So everybody get that if you want, because there are key commands for everything. So if you want to toggle, you can do this. And you'll see in the upper right-hand corner, see the F12. And likewise, if I hit Command, F12, it will allow me to toggle back. So that, it went, but it won't do that if the hub is not working. And why it's also important is that when you're building your models in Modeler, and that's where I am now, you're going to want to send them over to layout. To be able to do that, the hub has to be working. And it will be in layout where we will do some of the final surfacing. It will be where we do all of the lighting and where we render the scene which is basically taking a snapshot of your image, uh, of your model, okay? Now, <coughs> for whatever reason, the last person, oh, when, where I'm in layout, so sorry, I'm gonna click here and go back to Modeler. Where I would like you to be at the moment is in Modeler, and I'm gonna clo close this off, and I'm gonna close this off, and close this. So this is really all that you should see at the moment, this. And if I hit the A key, what it does, um, actually this is remnants from last semester, so I'm going to come back up here and I look at the top view. Okay. <coughs> By default, when you um, are working in Modeler, when it first launches, you'll be in a quad view. And this is what is distinctly different from working in a 3D modeling program or a 3D program versus a 2D program, because now you've not, you're in a 2D program, you're working with the X and the Y coordinates, correct? And now with the 3D program, you've actually added the Z, which in this particular case is perpendicular to the screen. So in order to get a sense of place or know where you are in this virtual world, you need to be able to see three different views in order to place that point or a, a thing in space. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so try to picture that. In order to place something in a three-dimensional space, you need to look at either the top or the bottom view. You need to look at either the front or the back view. And you need to look at either the right or the left view. Now, 3D modeling programs come in two versions. It's either the Y up or the Z up. In the correct mathematical terms, it would be Z up, okay? If you do this, okay, this, would, this in light wave represents the Y axis. The one that's perpendicular to the plane represents, or to the monitor represents the Z axis. And the one that's horizontal, that's parallel to the monitor is your X axis, okay? Does that make sense? If, if this doesn't make sense to you, you have to say, whoa, stop, it doesn't make sense. Don't be afraid to interrupt, okay? <coughs> in, in mathematics, though, this is actually the, the vertical one should be the Z. This one should be the Y, and this one should be the X. So some programs, you know, or, or true to what mathematics is, and for whatever reason, this one isn't, and as well as most applications. <coughs> so right now, we're thinking when you look at the monitor, and let's look at the, 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 the back view here. You'll see notations here. You'll see that this is a plus Y, this is minus Y. They're really small here. This is plus X, this is minus X over here on this side. When you're looking down on the top view, okay, then you're looking like so, and you see that the one that's vertical is your z-axis. The one that's horizontal remains the same as the back view. It's the, it's the x-axis. Does that make sense? <coughs> and then if we look at the right view or the left view, okay, again, that's along here, so that when you look at it, the horizontal is the X, it's the same as the back view, but in, um, I'm sorry, it's the Z, and, but the vertical is the Y. So the Y is actually the same as the X, is the back view, they're the same. And you need to look 
at each of those three positions in order to place something in space. To see what it looks like in its completed form, then you'll have up in the upper right hand corner here, and I can move it with this or I can use key commands. This is um, your perspective view. This is what it looks, what it will look like when it's in, in space. But to really get a clear placement of this in space, you need these three views. Now, there are other options available to you. You do not have to use quad view. Um, we will cover that on another day, how to, ch how to change that. Actually, I can cover it now, real quick. Hit D for display, okay? And you'll see under layout, that's the first tab that's listed here. We have presets and under layout, Below, it says quad. You'll notice all the other views here. You can look at a single view. You can look at a double view. Um, we can see three top, one bottom, three left, one right. They're just variations on this. They still, you see the X, Y, and Z, top, you know, top or bottom, front or back, and right or left. I because this is the way I learned it, just like the same, the, the plain old quad view. That's fine for me. And I will show you another quick way of doing something. So I just leave it in quad view the way it is now. And I don't want, I don't know why that jumped back to UV texture. I'm going to go back to top again. But if you move the cursor over any one of these viewports and you hit the zero key on your um, keyboard, for example, if I just wanted to see the, the perspective view, it zooms in on that. And then you hit the zero key again, and it zooms back to the quad view. So for me, this works just fine. You also have the option, too, if you want to see a larger view of one or the other. If you move the mouse, and you'll notice it, how it, the, the cursor changes when I move over the, the where the, the intersection of these, these viewports, if I click and I drag, notice that I can move this around and I can enlarge this and I can reduce the others and so on and so forth. Okay. So if we look now, the, let's look at the top and you'll see all of these different tabs. Okay. There is a different tool for just about everything. We start with the Create tab. The Create tab are all of your basic building blocks or your tools. So if we drop down here, here is your, these windows here, the first five, the File, Edit, Windows, Help, Surface Editor, Image Editor, these are constant. But as we click the different tabs, you'll notice that these others change. Okay. Everybody see that? So let's start with the create. The create starts with the primitives, and that's what we're going to start with. Primitives are a simple box or cube, a ball, or in two dimensions, it would be a, a, a circle or ellipse. A disk, which, could, which in 2D could also be an ellipse or a circle, but it, when, you, when extruded, it would become a cylinder. Cones, which also in 2D would be circles or ellipses, but in 3D, you see different kinds of cones. Um, capsules, never really used a capsule, but it's, a, it's kind of a, a, a stay. I mean, it's a part of this now. And there are some more down here. There's lots of them. Toroid, which is a torus or donus, donut shape. There are wedges. There's gears. There's gemstones. There's all kinds of stuff. Um, why they put a teapot in here, I guess, because it harkens back to the, one of the older ones, though. Okay, but these are all of your kind of presets. You can build these polygon by polygon if you want, and we will get to that. Um, but these are... Like an illustrator, these would be the same as having squares and ellipses and, um, you know, the rectangle tool or the ellipse tool or the whatever they have, the hex, you know, polygon tool. It's the same deal. Then we have text 
that you can build, and it starts in 2D, and then we can extrude it, turn it into 3D. <coughs> we can also create points, um, a variety of ways of doing that. We have our polygon tool. We have curves, which can turn into polygons, um, or they can remain just paths in space. Okay, so these are all of our create. And then it to, once you've created one of these, if you wish to modify any of those in any way, you have to pick a different tool. Even if you want to move it, it isn't simply like Illustrator or Photoshop, clicking on it and dragging it and move it. It doesn't work that way. Once you're done creating it, then you decide, okay, I'm done with that tool. Now I'm ready to move on and do something else. So now I turn off that tool and I select another tool. Does that make sense? Watch. If I want to make a simple box, I click. I can, there's a couple of ways that we can do this, but for example, I'll work with the top view and I'll click and drag and that doesn't look like much of a box, does it? It looks like a two-dimensional plane, which is what it is. And then I can come from either the perspective view and pull this up, or I could have done that from the back or the right view. I can also click on one of these other blue widgets and I can change the dimensions of it while I'm here. After I have completed it and I'm happy with the proportions of this, then I turn it off. I'm done with the tool. Now if I wish to move it, if I wish to rotate it, if I do wish to do something else with this, there's a whole bunch of things we can do. You have to pick a different tool and you have to decide what it is that you want to do and then there will be a tab that will determine what it is you're going to do to this or what you can do to it. So if I just simply want to move it, I go to Modify and I select Move. Or as you can see with most of these, there are keyboard equivalents. T for Move. Why they picked T, I don't know. Whoops, I picked Y. I want T. <coughs> now I can come in the perspective view and I can move it up. I can move it forwards, backwards. I can do whatever I want. If I'm not happy with that, I can hit Command Z to undo. Or notice more importantly, when we move from each of the quadrants, whether it be the top view, the back view, or the right view. Because what it does is it enables you to move along a plane, two coordinates. It doesn't allow you to move in the third. So if I move from the top view, it would be like taking a box or a chair and sliding it on the floor. I'm moving it along the X and Y coordinates, or the X and Z coordinates, aren't I? Right? If I click from the top view and I'm sliding the chair around, I'm only working on the X and um, Z coordinates. So as I click and I drag around here, it's sliding it. If I try to move it up, I can't. It only allows me to, to slide it along that Y plane. That's the Y plane. You're looking down the Y axis, so you're actually sliding it along the Y plane. On the other hand, if I wanted to move it up in space, <coughs> I could move it from the back view. That allows me to move it up. And so what I'm doing now, I'm sliding it along the Z plane. Notice it allows me just to move in those two directions. I can't move in the third direction. Is that making sense? Likewise, from the right view, it allows me to move here. It's sliding it around along the Z, I mean along the X plane, but along up or down the Y axis or back and forth along the Z axis. It only allows me to move in those directions. Okay? So it's getting used to this third dimension. And the reason I emphasize this is I know for myself, when I was learning this years ago, <coughs> it was really hard for me to get acclimated to this initially because it was so different from working in Photoshop or Illustrator or anything, okay, to get used to this, this third dimension. <coughs> One of the other things that we're going to have to pay attention to, and I can tell right off the bat that we are probably missing some tools. We may or we may not, but oftentimes the way they have these set up, you're going to be missing tools. So we have to be able to access them. So this is important that you listen to this. I will repeat it. 
but what we need to do is go to utilities. Okay, so there's another set of tools and utilities. And what we're going to do in utilities is we're going to edit the plugins. Um, this is one of the things that I think is nerve wracking with Lightwave is that in order to have access to all of the tools, there most of the tools are set up as plugins. And if they it doesn't recognize those plugins, that they aren't linked, then you don't have access to those tools. You don't even know they're there. So oftentimes you'll be looking in your 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 create on your create tab and wanting to build a model and you're missing half of your tools and wondering why, you know, where are they? Where do they go? So from time to time, when you come in here, what you will have to do is you click on the utilities tab and down near the bottom where it says plugins, you'll click on edit plugins. Okay, and it looks like I have most of them here. What I want to do is just simply not add plugins, but I want it to scan the directory. And you're going to want to know, well, where is the directory? The directory is, <coughs> if it knows where it is, I'm just going to go back. It looks like it's already in the plugin folder, but if I don't know that, I go back to the hard drive. I click on Applications. Within Applications, I scroll down and I find Lightwave 8. Okay. Then inside Lightwave 8, you'll notice that there should be a plugins folder right here. You just select on the Macintosh that folder and click Open. Okay. You'll see the little wheel spin. And it said, now it'll say, add plugins, 524 plugins found in 239 files, click OK. Now I have all of mine. And then all, when, I, when it's added them all, then I'm done. And you'll notice, not here, but if you were missing them, that they would be all added. And unfortunately, that's just a little quirk that we have with this. Did you experience that in the in the animation class? Yeah, okay. <coughs> so, um, typically, you start by building your model. And that's what we're doing. You'll notice it looks pretty generic, doesn't it? Um, let me go ahead and cut this. And I will show you, I, from my perspective, a, a, a better way to work. I'm going to move this over and I'm going to resize this just a little bit. There are some panels that, or, that I like to have open at all times. Um, one would be the numeric requester because that adds to in almost any tool you use, it adds usability. Especially when we get the modify tools or it doesn't matter, modify tools or the, um, the, build, the create tools, it will really help quite a bit. So you can do it one of two ways. Remember N for nu numeric requester, or you look at the bottom here and it says numeric. Does everybody see that little tab? Click on that and that little window pops up. And this will change, the content of this window will change depending on what tool you have selected. Another useful one will be the statistics window. A layers window would be another useful one from time to time. Statistics is this one, or hit W. This will give you a point count, and it will give you a polygon count. When you have um, non-planers, which we'll talk about more on another day. Did Chris talk about those? Yeah, because they can really mess up um, a rendering when you have non-planers. Um, it will point those out and you can correct them. So there's a lot of useful information. So I, this is how I like having my window set up. I like the quad view and I like always having the numeric requester up and I like having my point or, point or my polygon statistics up. If you want to see polygon statistics, notice at the bottom, this is states points. If I select polygons, notice it switches to polygon statistics. And in, your, in the, the, um, the animation class, you would also select bones. 
Well, um, I'm sorry, that's in layout. I'm looking at the wrong one. We, if you want symmetry, uh, modes will become important to us. And then there are these others. And later on, we'll use these tabs. This stands for weight, texture, um, morph targets, um, C, color, and these are sets. So again, a lot of this stuff we'll cover more later. But to give you a, a sense for an idea of how models are built, and I'll just do something very simple, okay? Let's, um, let, let's build a, a furry um, tennis ball, okay? To do that, um, the easiest way to do it would be to say, okay, I can select the ball because that's a, a primitive um, and I don't need to build one of those polygon by polygon. And then what I can do, notice that when I look in the upper right-hand corner, it says numeric ball tool. So that coordinates with whatever tool I have selected. That's why I like having that up there. What I can do is I can go to the activate and I can select reset. Okay, select reset. And then you'll notice what it does. It takes it to the default settings and that would be true for almost any of these tools. So if I create a ball now or a sphere, it would be to have 24 sides, 12 and 12 segments and the radius of the X, Y, and Z would be 500 millimeters. So take that in total, radius is only half, so that's a one meter in diameter sphere, right? To activate that, I could go back and I could do as I started here. I could click like so. Notice that the settings change and then I could click from the front and I could build it. But I don't know, I mean, I can tell just looking at the top view that it's not a perfect sphere, can I? But if I resize it, it becomes more of like a, a tablet or pill-like shape. But this is important. Notice that if I were just looking at the back view, it looks pretty circular. But if I look at the other views, it doesn't. Likewise, if I open it up like so, it almost looks, if I look here at, let's look at this view. They almost look pretty much like a per perfect sphere, but fear, sp can't talk, sphere. But when I look at the numeric requester, you'll see it's close, but no cigar. So if you wanted a perfect smear, s smear, sphere, the best way to do it would probably be to just say reset, and notice it sets it to a, a perfect one meter sphere. And that's just by resetting it, and then you can select activate. So I've got my sphere, really happy with it, and I'm done. Now, one again, I'm trying to, I will, from day one now, I'm going to try to instill some of my working habits. The next thing that I do in here is I can go ahead and I can hit the A key, and the A key makes this object fit tightly to all of the views. And what I like to do is the next step is that I like to apply a placeholder for the surface. Right now, it is a generic surface. It is just white. You'll notice that we're looking at it in the top, back, and right view in wireframe. That's really all these are. And in order to get it to look like wood, like fur, like any other surface, you need to apply some sort of skin to it. And you'll notice in per perspective view, by default, it's usually um, set up to, I'm trying to think, it could be flat shaded, which looks very similar. But I like using texture or sometimes textured wire. So I see both the texture and the wireframe at the same time. But you'll notice under here, lots of options of how you view it. I can also see it in perspective view, okay, just as a wireframe. And that's true for each of these quadrants. I mean, what if I wanted two perspective views? I could do that too. So here's a perspective view as a wireframe, and here's a perspective view as a textured view. I mean, all of these can be changed. You could have four perspective views if you wanted. I don't know what the advantage of that would be, but you could. So typically, as I say, you either have top, bottom, 
front, back, left, right, and perspective in the upper right-hand corner. Okay, so I'm happy with this, but I want to set a placeholder for the texture. So to do that, the easiest way to do that is to hit the key command of Q. Q says chain surface. Right now it's set to the default surface texture. So I'm going to click off default, and in place of default, I'm going to write in here skin. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to create, this is going to be kind of like uh, the texture or the color that you would have for, for the skin on a, uh, on a head. Okay? And now I can either click and drag along here so that I have um, spin, use the spinners by clicking and dragging on RGB, or I can click on the um, color tab here, and then I can pick from within here. And that looks sort of like a generic. darker skin tone and I click OK and then I click OK and voila it changes the color of it. This isn't necessarily what I want it to look like when I'm done. Maybe I want this to look like glass, maybe I want it to look like wood, maybe I want it to look like something else, who knows. But at least it's a placeholder so that as you build your model and you differentiate different parts of that model that are going to have different surfaces, you select the, the, the polygons in this case, if nothing is selected, everything is selected. Select the polygons that you want to have that surface and you name it. Just to get placeholders. It can be any color you want. It really doesn't matter. Okay? Now, I'm done with it. I'm happy with my head here. My, it's going to be my furry tennis ball. So what do I do? I need to save it. How do I know that I haven't saved it? Because you'll look at the top here. And it will say unnamed, and you'll also see a little asterisk. So even if I had opened this from a prior session and I had made modifications to it, the little asterisk indicates that this has not been saved. So now I'm going to save it. Um, now on to the next step. One of the things that you should do in this class when you have your thumb drive. Every, did anybody bring a thumb drive today? Okay. This is what I would do. I'm going to hit F11 to clear my programs right now. You'll notice that I have a content folder on here. Now, there is a content folder inside the hard drive that has a lot of files already in there, but I want you to have your own content folder. And this is how LightWave divides up the content folder, because if we look inside the content folder, you'll see that there's three additional folders. There's images, objects, and scenes. Okay. This will be saved under the object folder. When we create 2D images that will be used for surfaces, they will be saved in the image folder. When we send the object over to layout and we establish our lighting, when we establish the position of the camera, when we do anything else in there, in, in that particular view, we will have to save the scene, and it will be saved in the scene folder. It's really very important, and we can reset the content directory at any time so that it does direct to this, to this content folder that we've established for ourselves. Otherwise, that's another quirky thing with, with LightWave is that it gets confused. You'll see it, it will prompt you. You remember in in animation, you've, you'll open up a, an existing file from the content folder that you've saved, and it can't find the image, it can't find something, and you have to redirect it. It, it gets very confusing. So what I'm going to do for this semester is create a brand new one. So I'm going to hit right click, and we should all have, just about all of them should have three mutton, three mutton, three button mice. Um, and I'm going to create a new folder. And I'll call it um, content, and I'll call it um, spring 08 or 09. Okay, so this is my new content folder. Then I will double click and open it, and I will right click again and create three brand new folders. 
and I will rename each of those. And we'll start with the first one by double clicking on the name and name the first one images. Name the second one, um, come on. There we go. Um, objects. And name the third one. I'm having trouble selecting it here. You just double click on it. Come on. Why aren't you doing this? I hope you guys have better luck than me. This is so basic, and I can't get it to open. OK, I give up for the time being. OK, let's do this. Look at icons. There we go. Seams. I don't give up that easily. So this is where you will put all of your all of your files. And even if you're creating a surface in Photoshop, I recommend that you put it in your image folder just so that you have it there and you don't lose sight of where it's at. So now I can hit F11 and I can go back and I know where I'm going to save it. I'll save this as head because this is sort of like a head, a big ball or a tennis ball. So I'll go ahead and under the file, I'll go ahead and I'm going to say save object as, which is since I'm saving it for the first time. And to make sure that I'm saving it in the right place, I'm going to go ahead and scroll down, click on desktop, and you'll notice on desktop, you'll see that I have content spring 09. And then I'll click on objects so that it's in the object folder. And then I title it tennis ball. Or how about furry tennis ball? We'll do that. Hairy tennis ball. Hairy tennis ball. Because that's what this is going to be. But it doesn't look very hairy, does it? So our next step now, if we want to add some features to this to make it look like fur, can only be done in layout. If we want to take a snapshot of it so that we can print and we can hand it over to somebody, it can only be done in layout. If we're going to light it, if we're going to put this in space and light it like it's you know, in, in outer space or whatever, it, it, the only way it can be done is in layout. So what I'll do now, you'll notice that it says Harry Tennis Ball, since I've named it, no asterisk. And I can come up here, or I can go ahead and hit Command F12, and it toggles over. But it didn't send it over, did it? So what I need to do is come back here, and I need to just send object to layout. And if it's working properly, voila, it, it, send, it sent it over. And now every time I go back to Modeler and I update my model, it should update it here so that it's working back and forth if the, properly if the hub is working. So this looks like this is the way it's going to render, doesn't it? It looks a nice three-quarter view. I see the sphere. It's working nice. But watch what happens if I come up here. If I go over here to Render, the Render tab, that's what we're going to want over here. Notice that we have a separate set of tabs. We have Items. We also have the Modify tab. We have Setup. We have utilities, we have render, and we have view. Which, so we have a different set of tools over here in layout. Because I want to render this, I'm going to select a render tab. And one, the first thing that I want to do is I want to look at render options. <coughs> lots and lots of tools to deal with. Under render options, I can determine, make sure that image viewer is selected. If none is selected, it, I won't be able to actually save a snapshot of it. Okay, so that's the, one of the things that I'll have to do. I want image viewer. If I want to show the rendering in progress, maybe I don't. That will be there. Viper is another thing that I can turn on here. 
if I plan on having shadows, if I plan on having transparency, if I plan on having reflections, if I want refraction index, all of these things need to be checked off. Okay, so it's in really realistic mode right now. So I've got that set. <coughs> now, if I want to add here, if I go ahead and I render it now, and you'll see under here either you hit F9 or I click render frame, and it takes a snapshot of it. It's all done, I abort, and now I have the image. Um, not very pleasant. I can see all the facets. Each of these little squares are polygons, so maybe I need to smooth that out. And I also haven't added any fur, have I? And also you'll notice a little bit of jaggies around the edge. So these are all things that we have to look at and consider and tweak when we're ready to render it. So we're still not done yet. There's more tools and buttons that we have to press to get this thing to work right. So I'll go ahead and I'll hide this. And I'm going to do a few things. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go make sure that I have camera selected so that I have camera. And I'm going to, and that's one of the options we have down here. We can select objects, bones, lights, cameras. With camera selected, I'm going to look at camera properties. And it will be here that I can control the quality of the rendering. If I look down here, I can turn on anti-aliasing. And I'll do classic low enhanced. That's all I'm changing, nothing else. And now I'll go ahead and I'll render the frame again. And now, if I bring this back up, let's go ahead and abort that. Notice that those little jaggies are gone. That one little thing made an, a considerable improvement, didn't it? And if I want to compare that to that one, to that one, does everybody see the slight difference? It's just, it could, just one little thing, one little button can make a whole difference in how your, your model appears. Let's do something else. Let's go ahead and let's change this. That we really don't need any more geometry to this for what we're doing, even if I wanted it, no hair at all. If I wanted to change this, one of the things that I could do is I would have to look at the surface editor. We added a temporary, a temporary surface, but there's all kinds of things that we can add to the surface in here. We can make it transparent, we can add bump maps, we can add, make it glossy, we can do all sorts of things to this. Any kind of feature that you can think of on a surface, we can do in here. So where is that? We go to surface editor. There is a surface editor, and while they look the same, they are not. One in layout, and there is one in modeler. And you'll notice that the only surface that I have right now, aside from the default is skin. So here is the skin. And you'll notice at the bottom here, one of the things that we can do, if I wanted to change the color of this right now, I could, well, let's say I wanted to make it a little bit darker. And I click OK, and notice it darkened it. So I can change that on the fly. If I wanted to make it pink, I can come back here, and let's make it pink. OK? It changes it. Now, it may not look exactly the way you expect it to look because in here, what it's doing is it's basing the color that we see on the lights that are available in the scene, and there is a default light. As we add lights or we change the property of lights, the color will change. Just as if you imagine this, if you look at a fire truck at night, it does not look like the bright fire engine red that you see during the day, does it? The same principle. The light that's available changes the way you see color dramatically. So I have my skin color. I'm happy with it. I could add other properties to these. I could add bump maps. I could add, make it transparent. I can add translucency, all sorts of things that we'll get to on another day. But that's one of the things. I wanted to smooth this out, though. All I have to do is click smoothing, and notice it smooths that out. That's one of the things that we can do. So there's another button I hit. And look at two buttons that I've touched, and look at how dramatically this will change. Now, I could have done this in Modeler. But what I couldn't do in Modeler is to add fur to this. That's why 
my practice is I set a basic placeholder in layout, er, in modeler, and then I do most of my fine tuning, the fine tuning of my surfaces and layout, because that provides all the tools that I will need in here. Also, even when you use Viper, which stands for the Versatile Interactive Preview Render, there are a lot of things that you will not be able to see and see accurately. So unfortunately, what you'll have to do is to render it. Okay. So how do I get fur? Fur, unfortunately, is a two-step process. This is what I have to do. I have to go, and I'm, again, I know some of you are taking notes. You don't have to take notes. This is, I'm just trying to go through the kinds of procedures that you have to go through to get these results. When we go to window, what I need to do is look at image processing. And what I'm going to do now under image processing is I'm going to add a pixel filter. You'll notice that if I wanted this to glow, I could add a glow feature. I could do all kinds of stuff. Under pixel filter, you notice that it has SAS light. Low anti-aliasing. I can double click on this and that's okay. I can leave these default settings, but that's not really where I change the settings for this. But that's one step. Even if I go in here and I render the frame, no fur. I added SAS light. What is it? Why isn't it doing that? It isn't doing that at all. That's only one step. That allows me to use SAS light now. So I have image processing. <coughs> the other step now is to add the shader SAS light. So now it gets even more complicated. Now this time, <coughs> instead of selecting the camera, I'm going to select objects. I only have one object. If I had more, they would be listed under this tab here. And now what I'll do is I'm going to select properties. And you'll notice under properties, I have all kinds of things here. I have geometry. I have deform. And I can add a displacement map. I have render. I have edges, lights, whether it's affected by lights or not, dynamics, all sorts of stuff. Now you'll notice here under Deform, way down near the bottom is SAS Light. Look at all of the other shaders that are available. I'm going to set, select SAS Light. I've added it and now I double click on it and now you'll see there's lots of settings that I have available. I can determine the fiber color. I can, con con um <coughs> I can control the brightness and U variation. So that, I mean, if you look at your hair, it is not a single color. It is a whole variety of colors. Anybody who has a color of hair that just one looks weird. It's, <coughs> it's only when you look at um, like a teddy bear or you look at dolls that have hair that's um, synthetic, that's all the same, where you see a single color, where there is no hue variation. I could also turn the fiber color green. So maybe instead of hair, I want to turn this into grass. There's a lot of uses that we can use for something like SAS Light. I can control how shiny the hair is or how matte the hair is. I can control the coarseness or the frizziness. I can control clump sizes. I can control whether it bends or whether it stayed straight up or how dense it is or how long it is or how short it is. <coughs> Tons of things. I'm just going to leave the default settings. And I'm going to click OK, and I'm going to close it, and now I'm going to render it one more time. So I'm going to go ahead and render the file. It rendered it with a pink skin color, and now it's applying SAS light, and in just a second, we are going to have our fuzzy tennis ball. So look at all the steps I had to go through, and all the buttons I had to push just to get this. <coughs> Does it make sense? Sort of? And now that I'm done with this, since we're not animating this, if I were animating this, I could use the time down, timeline down below, and you'll see that that's what this is. So some of you who are in the animation class or have taken it can now animate this. We can have it fly around the room. We can have it bounce around. We can do what all, all sorts of stuff. In this class, we don't do that. We can add a bone structure to it and have it dance, like you do with Chris's class, where you have that 
sack of flour and it's dancing all over the place. You can do that. That's where that's the step after that. In this class, the only thing that we're concerned with is, is the building it, surfacing it, lighting it, creating an interesting scene. <coughs> More of a two of an illustration approach. And now when I'm done with this, if I'm really happy with this, and this is my portfolio piece, I can now save this. And if you have all of the the plugins, you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of different file types I can save this as. In this class, I would like you to save it in two different file types. Save it as a Photoshop file, 24-bit. That will be your original file. And also save it as a JPEG file, and that's what you will email me. You'll attach it to an email, send it to me. I will look at it. I will observe it. I will make comments on it, grade it, send the file back to you. At any time, if you want to print these out for yourself, once they're saved in any one of these formats, and it will be saved, well, let's go ahead and save it as a Photoshop file. Photoshop 24 brings up the window. I go back to desktop. I go to my content folder. I go to images, <coughs> and we'll call it, you know, fuzzy tennis ball. And that'll be the name of it, and it's there. If we go back and we look at it, <coughs> now we have our content folder. We look at images. Whoops, wrong folder. Sorry. Image folder. There's our fuzzy tennis ball. We go back over here. We look at objects. We have our hairy tennis ball. What have I forgotten to do? If I want to recreate this scene, if I want to bring it up again, with the lighting, with the image processing, with the SAS light, all those were done in layout. I also need to save the scene. So in addition to that, lots to remember, huh? This is way more complicated to get something even as simple as a fuzzy tennis ball than doing something in Photoshop or Illustrator. The next thing that we have to do <coughs> now will be to save the scene. File. Okay. What I want to do is save, and now what I'm going to do is save scene as first. The first time you do this, just like in any program, you save scene as, not just save as, save. Brings up the window, <coughs> I go back again, I go to the desktop, I go to content, I select scenes, and I'll call it our fuzzy tennis ball scene. And now you think you're done because you've saved it all, and you haven't. You're still not done because I have made changes to the model in layout. I have, I have saved the scene, so I've saved the lighting. I have saved the camera properties. I've changed in saved image processing. But what was attached to the object was SAS light, the deform. I did not save the object. So in addition to that, <coughs> when you're done, I also need to go to File, and I need to select Save, and I need to select Save All Objects. You can save Current Object, Save Object Copy, Save Object Increment. The safest thing when you're dealing with one object is just to say Save All Objects. This is Are you, want to sure, are you sure you want to save all objects? Yes. Now, all those properties that I changed, and that I changed the surface from a kind of a sort of a generic flesh color to a pink, that saved. I saved the deform settings. <coughs> I've saved all those things now. Now I'm done. Whew. Now I can close everything. I can open it all back up, go back on modeler. I can deform it. I can change it, I can change the settings, and I can go back and lay out and change the lighting, add increments to the lighting, do whatever or to the scene, do whatever I want. <coughs> this, in a nutshell, is what working in 3D is all about. And I really didn't build anything. I made a sphere. I added a little bit of color to it, and I added some fur to it. And it's a fairly tedious process. Once you get the system down, and if you write some of the basic 
properties down, you know, from making sure that if you want um, smoothing on selected and texture, um, that might be important. Um, if you want, if you especially in layout, when you click on camera properties, you want to make sure that um, that some anti-aliasing is turned on when you're saving the final one so that you get rid of those jaggies. In this case, it wouldn't have been a big deal. You, it really would have been unnecessary because the fur would have covered it all up. But if you wanted just a nice clean sphere, then that's something different. You know, then you would see those jaggies and it would make your final project, all the work you had done, look sort of unsightly. It's like, what's all, what are these, all these you know, pixels doing around the edge? And all it was is clicking on one box inside camera settings. So in addition to developing the skills for using the tools um, and using them efficiently, there is a lot of kind of little tidy work that you have to pay attention to to make it work, to make everything work together with one another. Now, there's one other thing that I need to show you just <coughs> out of, for the heck of it here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move this to the side. That's for the heck of it. I'm going to go back to Modeler. <coughs> and again, this is another practice that I follow. I'm done with my fuzzy tennis ball. Now I'm going to create a cube or I'm going to create a table or something on which the fuzzy tennis ball is going to sit. So I'm just going to make, or a floor, maybe I want it to sit on a ground, okay? Right now, if you notice, it's just sitting in space. It's black. It's as if there were no stars, nothing. This is before the universe began, okay? That's what you see. I can put in a background. What I can also do is I can also put in a ground plane. So maybe I want to do that. I could do that in here, but I think that's bad practice. I could put a ground in here, I could save it, it would be on a separate layer, it could be it's part of the same thing, it's a part of the same object. I try to treat every object as a separate entity. Just as you push, as you're pushing the shopping cart through the supermarket, you have a box of soap, you have, um, you know, you have a bottle of dishwashing detergent, they're both soap, but they're different entities, aren't they? They're separate elements. And then you go over to the food section and you get some carrots. That's a separate entity. Don't put them all, uh, while you're putting them in one shopping cart, that would be like the scene or layout. They still have their, their, their own identity, their own separateness. So what I would do, <coughs> and this is again my practice, is I go to file and I want to create new object. Now the other one did not go away. It's still here. Here's my hairy tennis ball or my furry tennis ball. Here's my new unnamed one. So you can have multiple objects or multiple entities open at the same time. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the box tool and I'm going to create a little box here. So it's going to sit not just on a floor, but it's going to sit on something that's three-dimensional. I'll, I'll do it the floor, I guess. It is. And again, when I'm done, I turn it off. I'm going to select a, pl a placeholder for it. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hit the Q and in, I'm going to go ahead, instead of default, I'm going to make this um, floor or ground or whatever. And I'll click on here. And let's just make it um, yellow for the heck of it, just so we can see this. And I click OK. It's there. And now I need to save it. File. Save object as. It's in my objects folder. It already knows. I'll name it floor. So it's saved. And now I can send it to layout. And when I send it to layout, anytime you create an object in Modeler, it remembers the exact coordinates. So when it goes to layout, it's in that exact place. Does that make sense? Look at here, it's sitting on the ground plane. It's in the middle. When I go back over here to layout, if I go ahead and I say send object to layout, notice I had moved the sphere, hadn't I? And it placed it right in the middle, exactly where I had set it. So now if I want the sphere, I can move this over. And now look at that. The sphere is not sitting on top of it. It's in the middle of it. It's right on top. So now I can go ahead and I can click like so. And I'm looking at this in perspective view. And I'm thinking, you know what? This looks pretty good. 
<coughs> maybe I can resize this. The sphere is a little bit too big, my fuzzy tennis ball. So instead of items, I'll select modify. You'll notice down here, here I have hairy tennis ball. And now I can, re whoops, I want to go ahead and I'm going to not move it. I'm going to resize it. So let's go to modify and let's select size or shift H. And we'll go ahead and we'll shift it. Now it's floating above the air. I hit T for move. Whoops, T for move. And I can use the handles to push it down. So it's either sitting on top or not. <coughs> and I'm done for the time being. And you're going to think to yourself, okay, I'm going to zoom in here. And now I'm going to take a snapshot of it, and it should look just like this, shouldn't it? So now I go ahead and I go back to render, and I render the frame. And something is wrong here, huh? Look at that. I don't even see the plane here. Why do you think that is? Camera. Because we're looking at this from perspective view. That's kind of like director's view. This is what the director would see. What we want to switch to and lay out is camera view. So you'll notice from camera view, the plane is on the horizon line. You don't see it. The way I would have to see it would be to move the camera. So now when I'm from camera view, I select the camera, I hit T for move, I can hold down the command key to move it up. So look at I'm moving the camera up, but it's, it's looking straight ahead. I hit Y, and now I can rotate the camera. Now I'm looking down on it. Now if I want to hit T again to move, it zooms in. Maybe I want to move the camera down a little bit. Zoom in again. Now I'm looking at it from the camera view. Now when I render the frame, you'll see it with shadow and all. Okay, So lots of things to think about. I'm going to be running out of tape soon. Um, so mm -hmm. this is, is a basic overview. Now would be a good time probably to take maybe a 15-minute break. We can come back and then, since not all of you, because they're installing software, are going to have access to computers, you guys can share. You can open up the software, and for maybe about an additional hour, you can sit and tinker with what I've done so far, play with some of the tools, and then next Wednesday, I hope we will have all the computers operational. And then what we're going to do is we're actually going to start building things. And we're going to, I try to go through it systematically. We go through all of the, the basic building tools, the modification tools, and then there are additional tools to change the geometry, add to the geometry, subtract the geometry, a whole bunch of different things that we can do. And then after that, we move on to surfacing. Once you have a basic understanding of how to build the objects, how do you surface them? How do you control the surface? Right now, I made it look like a fuzzy tennis ball. What if I wanted to turn that ball into a glass? What if I wanted to make it look like plastic? What if I want to look like it was made out of wood? You know, I can use the same geometry and apply different surfaces to it. How do I control the lighting? How do I make it look like it's lit by sunlight? How do I make it look like it's lit by a fluorescent light? How do I change all of those properties? Anything that you observe that you see in the real world, you have to think about and you have to apply to what you're doing in this virtual world that you're creating. Okay? There's lots of things that you don't, I mean, even if I wanted this thing to look, this fuzzy tennis ball to look like it was sitting on a tennis court. I would not necessarily have to build the tennis court. I could use a photograph, and I could use some, some very nice tools and use that photograph in the background, and I could use compositing to combine the tennis ball with that image, as well as the ground plane, to make it look like it's actually sitting in there. And that's what you see all the time in film now. You see a combi combination of live action and CG, computer graphics, and they are seamlessly put together. Where it, when it happens and it works best, you don't know where the live action 
ends and the CG begins and vice versa. You know, it is just really stunning. And so that's one of the things in creating more, something more illustrative, creating something that's really an, a, a wonderful scene that's not just building the objects, but lighting it and maybe using compositing techniques to actually integrate some of the things that you've done with some interesting in, in, in some interesting environments. We're going to work on that too. Okay, so go ahead and take a 15-minute break, and then we'll um, come back, and you can t you guys can tinker with this. <laughs>